Now, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the whore of Babylon, and we have dealt with that system in 3rd Adam 1 and 2. But in Revelation chapter 18, it talks about this mystery religion, this city of Babylon. I don't have to tell you that we live in a wicked world, and men are consumed with wickedness and they're trying their best to proselytize their wickedness but they're not going after you and me no no they're not going after us they're going after the children i don't believe that um i, I should be seeing signs uh, advertising for children to be dancing on stage with men It's one thing for you to be in wickedness yourself. It's another thing for you to recruit children into your debauchery as well. Oh, I grow sick of this old wicked world. I grow sick of the nastiness that's out there. I long for a better day. And the truth is, is that God does not turn a blind eye to sin. He sees it, and he will judge. You see, friend, God is love, but God is not harmless. God has a millstone. and he will use it before too long. My name is Spencer Smith. I'm a Christian, a husband, a Christian dad. I'm a church member, I'm a missionary, and I am a filmmaker. I love what I do. I love the life that God has given me. In 2020, our YouTube channel literally exploded. We were able to create three documentaries that year, Third Adam 1, Third Adam 2, and God's Millstone. And it was during this time our channel was experiencing exponential growth. I mean, it was, it was radical how, how big our channel grew so quickly. And the Lord blessed and we're thankful for that. God's Millstone is based off of the sermon that Jesus gave about children. When He said, Suffer the little children to come unto Me. And He made the illustration there. He said, If anyone would offend one of these little ones and entice them away from Christ into sin, that it would have been better for them if they had just had a millstone cast around their neck and cast into the sea. Now that's very, that's very descriptive language, especially coming from the Lord Jesus. Uh, what, what was He saying? What did He mean by that? What He meant was that the judgment of God that is coming upon this world will be severe. But for those who entice children away from Christ into sin, your judgment will be so terrible and so drastic that it would have been better for you to die in such a way than to have done that. And that's what the Lord Jesus was saying. Now, when we made this documentary, we noticed that there was a big demand for our films, and there still is. Third Adam 1 went to 100,000 views very quickly. Third Adam 2 
the same. I mean, 100,000 views very quickly. And God's Millstone went to about 60,000 views and stopped. And I, I don't have an explanation as to why. And I went and studied and just dug through the analytics and I realized that over the course of 90 days, this documentary had probably had 300 views on it. I mean, it, it had gotten up to 60, but stopped, and over the next 90 days, it had only gotten about 300 views, which was very unusual. We were getting about 2 million views a month on our channel. Now, I cannot prove that YouTube shadow banned that documentary. I can't prove it. I wish I could, but I can't. There's no way to prove it. But all the evidence seems to indicate that that's what happened. And then YouTube changed their terms of service, and it seemed like maybe there was a potential violation there and I wasn't too sure. I was really unsettled about it, so what I did is I took it off the channel. I didn't want to risk the entire channel just for one documentary. But I think due to recent events, it is time to re-upload a remastered version of this documentary to YouTube. This progressive agenda is advancing very quickly. And by the way, it is not a progressive agenda. It is an anti-God, anti-Christ agenda. And it is a serious deal. As a Christian dad, I have all the same concerns that other Christian parents have. I don't want my kids messed up in the world. I don't want my kids messed up in sin. I don't want my kids messed up in wickedness. I think it's a serious deal. And so we're going to put this information out again. And during the course of the documentary, you might find there are some things that are blurred out or some words that it doesn't show all the word on that. And we do that on purpose just to try to stay within the guidelines of YouTube and, and uh, do all that. We pray that God will speak to your heart as you watch this documentary. We pray that Christ will get the glory. There is a real war going on for children. And it's very important that we win this war. God bless you, friend, as you watch this film. And it says in verse number one, And after these things I saw another angel came down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. I love the Bible. I love to study it. I love to read it. The Bible is the Word of God. And it paints a picture of mankind's condition with brutal accuracy. There have been many times through the years I've read the Bible and been blessed. But I have to be honest, there's times that I've read the Bible and just been shocked at what I read. The Bible pulls no punches on the wicked deeds of man. And sometimes I think, how could people be so evil? Which leads me to think, how could God be so merciful to these evil people? Even someone like me. And I think today, as Christians, we have lost sight of how wicked this world is, and of the exceedingly sinful nature of fallen man. He obviously didn't tell, just like Jeffrey Epstein. Shut up! I know he's your friend, but I don't care. You had to make your own way here and your own plane, didn't you? Right. I can be all the things you told me not to be. Why that house that night? Why they Which house? There? Which night? The house on Cello Drive, the, the Tate house. Why did they go there that night? I guess when I'm in that skirt. 
a vacation on Pleasure Island. Pleasure Island? Yes, that happy land of carefree boys, where every day is a holiday. So you have these influencers, and they promise these girls that if they just go on tea, everything will get better. You showed me how to accept people for who they truly are, starting with myself. Man's not changed. In this video, I hope to convey to you God's opinion of man's sinful behavior, especially that that is done towards children. How could people be so wicked that they would actually offer up their own children unto Moloch? And then I see almost identical things being done today. As a father of four, I have been studying the Bible, asking God to show me what He wants me to see about children and how to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. One thing stuck out to me as I was studying about children in the Bible, and that was a statement made by the Lord Jesus about offending little ones. And I realized that God has a severe judgment upon those who would entice children into wickedness and sin. You know, it's one thing for an adult person to spend their days messing with debauchery and living a life of total depravity, that's one thing. But when they go so far as to recruit children, to entice children into the same wickedness and terrible sin that they are in, then God sees that completely different. In this video, we will discuss the judgment of God upon those who would offend and entice children into sin. Now, we live in a world where so many adults are doing unbelievable, unspeakable, wicked things with their bodies and with their lives and are into all kinds of terrible anti-God things. People are doing terrible things to each other and with each other, and we all know that. But what happens when these people who are doing these terrible things to each other and with each other start doing these terrible things to children? We find that, yes, there is a judgment of God upon those who commit these sins, but there's even a greater judgment upon those who would enlist children into these crippling, debilitating, life-altering sins. Said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same as greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. And verse number six is a, one of those verses that is stone cold chilling if you really get what he's saying. He says, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. That's the lovely Lord Jesus Christ that said that. God has a millstone and he's not scared to use it. And that should terrify certain people in this world. I want to say that the Lord Jesus Christ was a compassionate man. There were times where Jesus wept over people. He wept over cities. But there were other times where Jesus said something that was so strong, hard, and rigid that it really shocked everybody that was around him. There are many people in churches today that want to focus on the sweet side of Jesus. And there's a lot there. But there's very few that dare to actually paint the whole picture. I believe it was H.A. Ironside that made the claim that Jesus preached on hell twice as much as he preached on heaven and if that's true, that's very significant because that redefines what everybody says is Christ-likeness today. One of these incredible statements was made by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, where he says that if you offend one of these little ones which believe on me, it'd be better for you if a millstone were hanging around your neck and that you were drowned in the depth of the sea. I want to tell you, there's lines that you can cross with God. There's things that you can do that... If you had just died, 
In the day of judgment, you would be far better off than if you had lived and done that. Back now with our special series, Uncovered. Tonight, an exclusive look at... Corp. The grand jury report details allegations against more than 300 in six dioceses, covering more than 1.7 million parishioners. If you go there to Matthew chapter 17, there was a situation where Jesus was doing his earthly ministry. In verse number 14 of Matthew 17, the Bible says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to the disciples and they could not cure him. Verse 18 says, And Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Mark chapter number 9. And verse number 21 says this. Jesus asked the question. He said, And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. So what you have is this young person that is foaming at the mouth, demon-possessed, crazy, and Jesus asked the question, said, How long has he been this way? And the man said, Of a child. Can I tell you, and I want to make a statement to you, and this is maybe oversimplistic, but it's true. I want you to know that the devil is after children. I did a weird study years ago. I studied serial killers. I studied their life. I studied their lifestyles. I studied what made them what they were. And I found a commonality amongst all serial killers. All serial killers had something in their life as a child, as a six and seven and eight year old that never was corrected. And that's that little thing that was in their life however small it was, grew and grew and grew and grew until it completely took over their life and they became the monsters that they were. And pornography can reach out and snatch a kid out of any house today. He, he snatched me out of my home, it snatched me out of my home 20, 30 years ago. And as diligent as my parents were, And they were diligent in protecting their children. And as good a Christian home as we had, and we had a wonderful Christian home. But all of that begun, begins as a little child. Can I tell you, you don't just wake up one day and say, you know, I think I'm going to go for school. I wonder what that's like. People that do that, there's a long runway to that where there's a buildup of little things that acquire and accumulate and compound in that person's mind and soul and spirit to where they end up doing monstrously horrible things. And I want you to know that Satan is a sadistic creature and he'll destroy anyone and everyone that he can. He can't really get us all, but the fact that he can get some of us should alarm you. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8 that Satan is... A roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Lions will take whatever they can get. They'll take the big ones, and they'll take the little ones if they can. And that's what the Lord said when he talked about a lion. They'll take whatever they can get. And can I tell you, just as, just as a lion pursues the youngest and weakest of the herd, Satan pursues and attacks the weakest of us all. So the concept that the Lord Jesus Christ was trying to convey is actually very simple. You have the little ones and let's put over here and over here let's put the savior every soul has a choice that they have to make do you want your sin or do you want the lord jesus christ to be your savior everybody's got to make that choice now the word offend means to allure to evil i looked it up the word literally in the greek is the root word is the word we get scandal from it's a scandalous offense as I looked up the word offend in verse number uh, two, it literally means to put a stumbling block or impediment in the way upon which another may trip and fall. It means to entice to sin. I wanna say thank you so much 
from the bottom of my heart for voting for me. Um, Nickelodeon always will hold such a tremendous place in my heart. Thirdly, to cause a person to begin to distrust and desert one whom he ought to trust and obey. If you are a science teacher with a student who's whose parents insist that he or she not be exposed to, to evolution. To evolution. It means to cause a person to fall away. It means to cause one to judge unfavorably or unjustly of another. So we understand that when he's talking in verse number two about offending one of these little ones, he's talking about doing something to them that is so great that it can alter their life. So much in this place is deeply unsettling. Waves are met with nothing. Those natural instincts of a child, they're not here. It can alter the way they think. It can alter the way they look at people. Causing children to sin, teaching them how to sin, robbing them of their innocence, introducing them to sinful activities. For tonight about the investigation of a church pastor in Hammond, Indiana. Lake County authorities say they should know in the next week if charges will be filed against Jack Scopp, who has been dismissed as pastor of the First Baptist Church of Hammond. And basically, to push someone away from Christ into sin is to offend them. I think that's what the Lord was speaking of when He said that if you were to take these little ones, these children here, and you were to do something to them to allure them away from Christ into sin to where they die and go to hell, then it would be better for you in the day of judgment to have just simply died than to have lived and done this to these little ones. But the opposite of the word offend is found a few chapters later when Jesus used the word, suffer the little children to come unto me. Suffer them and forbid them not. Verse 14, but Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. You know, I was looking and studying the word offend, and I was trying to understand what that word meant. And, and really, in a sense, it has something to do with like a bear trap. You snared them, and they can't function anymore. They are they're captured. They are offended. They're caught. And I, I thought to myself, well, what is the opposite of the word offend? What is the opposite of offending a little one? And the answer is the opposite of offend is to suffer them to come unto me. Can I tell you, can I use this illustration? Let's just say this pulpit is Christ and that there's children behind me. If I were to offend children from coming to Christ, I would be doing this and keeping them away. I would be blocking them, hindering them. Stepping between them and Christ. From Kentwood, Louisiana, here is 10-year-old Brittany Spears. No can build Say hi, Katie. Say, I'm going to win. Dad! Say But to suffer them means to take them and to push them towards Christ. So to suffer a little one to come to Christ is to push them towards the Lord Jesus. That's what the word suffer means. What we all have to understand is that there is a great reward for those who would suffer little ones to come to the Savior. And this reward is spoken of throughout all the Bible. He that winneth souls is wise. They that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever. There is a great reward for those who suffer little ones to come to the Savior. But the opposite is true as well. There is a great, terrible judgment of God upon those who would offend the little ones and push them into sin. It's one thing for you to be some immoral, depraved person, but is a whole nother thing for you to be drawing children into your depravity as well. In my examination of modern culture, I have found basically four areas where adult people are offending young people away from God into sin and eventually into hell. Those four areas are entertainment, politics, education, and religion. 
For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And so there is a strong sexual uh, sinfulness here in this city, and it talks about being the habitation of devils and uh, the hold of every foul spirit there in verse number 2. I remember growing up in Metro Atlanta and during the summer I would always go to daycare during the day and one day they took us on an activity to a skating rink. One time we went in there and there was this new arcade game that I had never seen before. And I think at this point in my life I was probably second grade or so. On the side of this box there was this ninja and I thought, man, this is so awesome. So I sat there and watched some of the kids play, some of the older kids play it. And I realized this is a fighting game with ninjas. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. And I remember watching one particular fight where one of the ninjas went over and actually ripped the other fighter's head out. And I couldn't believe what I had just seen. And I went home and told my parents, I said, you're not gonna believe what I just saw at the skating ring. And that was really one of the moments in my life where I remember that violence started becoming normalized to me. My question was, why was that directed towards children? Why was a second grade little boy allowed to see that and be rewarded for doing that on a video game platform? That's how this sinful world works. These people are always targeting children so that they can create future customers for their product. And if you watch modern day entertainment, kids entertainment, you'll see that all of these things, all the vices of the world, all the occultism, all the anti-God philosophies are completely saturating the kids' entertainment today. Many of these children are taught to be atheistic God-haters by the very television programs that parents trust to provide good, clean entertainment. Now, the Bible describes to us the difference between flesh and spirit. Now, if a person is spiritual and walking in obedience to the Lord and walking with the Lord, it actually gives a description of what their life will look like, and then also gives a description of the works of the flesh. If you're walking in the flesh, then this is the things that are going to be in your life. And so the Bible describes all this in Galatians chapter 5. And it says then, verse number 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Okay, so it goes on and gives the works of the flesh in these next few verses here. It says, The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness... Good boy. Prospector, how about you? And so you two are oh. absolutely identical. <laughs> He's a town attorney and my fiance. What? <laughs> she just likes me from a body. Well, we could share, you know. I work alone. Well, I think you need to be more flexible. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. on her 16th birthday. She will prick her finger on the spindle of a spinning wheel. Variants, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murder. Long live the king. Do you know what I had to do to get the power that I have? The sacrifices that I've made, the bodies that I've buried. That's why I need them, and why I no longer need you! Drunkenness, revelings, and such like. I want a God that gets done. If I for us, it will be Guest on it. Syrup and coffee? Why didn't I think of that? Can I try some? Yes. I love syrup. And then it goes on in verse 22 and describes the fruit of the Spirit. And it says it's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. What is happening is that the entertainment industry is actually glorifying the works of the flesh in the minds of these children. And they are actually being programmed to behave and do these things that are being done in these videos. And one thing that we all have to keep in mind 
is that these are unsaved adult people that are producing these videos and producing this entertainment. And it is not designed to point you to Jesus Christ. It is designed to entertain you and program you into the world system. Pattern in the spell circle. What? Where? It looks like this. There. One of the main ways that the devil is using entertainment to draw kids away from God is in the form of video games. Now, back when I was a kid, it was all about the graphics and story and gameplay, but the dirty little secret now about modern gaming is that it is designed to be addictive. These video game companies often consult with the same people in Las Vegas that run the casinos trying to uh, understand and s help us understand and know what keeps people's attention and what keeps them coming back. And there are a lot of psychiatrists and mental health experts that are dreadfully concerned about how many parents are just handing tablets and phones off to their children because of the psychological effects and the addictive nature of these games that are coming out today. If you go just about anywhere, you'll see this, people locked in on their screens. It's happening inside our houses too, especially with kids and video games. And researchers are finding it's creating an epidemic with dire consequences. In fact, this week, the World Health Organization is expected to officially classify gaming disorder as a disease. One estimate young Americans spend 10,000 hours playing video games before they turn the age of 21. That's about the same amount of time they spend in the classroom during all of middle school and high school. It's a sobering comparison, isn't it? The American yeah. Academy of Pediatrics says 92% of school age kids play video games. Nearly 10% of those kids are addicts. If you think about the number of hours or free time that is spent engaged in gaming, they're not doing much else. So they're not engaged in other activities that would be normative for their age and developmental level. Uh, so the more they seclude, seclude themselves and engage in those solitary activities, um, the less they're doing other age appropriate tasks. And again, w where they should be spending time doing homework or doing chores, they spend time more avoiding those areas, which ends up causing impairment in their life. The stimulation we receive from playing a video game impacts the same pathways that are present when one is becoming intoxicated with a substance. So it's no surprise that many of the behaviors and reactions uh, that we see for a child who's struggling with having this sudden stop brought about in their video game playing has analogs to someone who is being asked to stop usage of a substance. You see, years ago, video games used to be about a story and graphics and great gameplay, but that's not the angle these companies are taking today. All of these games have a daily reward for playing every day so that you create a habit of every day playing your video game. All of it is designed to create an addiction, and when you are addicted to entertainment and addicted to these games, you're not thinking about God. These video games are paying millions of dollars in consulting fees and putting graphics on the screen, doing everything they can to get your attention and keep your eyes on that screen constantly. And when people are addicted, especially children are addicted, they're not thinking about the Lord. I challenge you, go to the average kid in your church and ask them about Jesus and see what they do. And then ask them about Minecraft and see how they react. You'll find very quickly that Satan is using entertainment to steal the affection of children away from God and His Word. You know, I've got a lot of friends that are youth pastors or have been youth pastors. And a lot of them, you know, we have the same discussion really. How do you get kids excited about God? How do you get them fired up for Jesus? How do you get them interested in the things of God? And after all of these discussions and all the years of observing, I have come to the conclusion that for many youth pastors, 
they will never be able to accomplish that goal. And I'm not being a fatalist when I say that, I just am looking at what these kids are up against and what these youth pastors are up against. You see, the average kid gets up every day and he goes to school and he's being taught that he's a monkey, he's a, he's a product of evolution and that God has no place in how he came to be. And then he goes and spends all his time with friends and people that are into all kinds of uh, drug addictions and, and substance abuse. And then we've got the internet today and the internet is just pouring filth into kids' minds right and left. And then the entertainment business comes to be in a kid's life. All of these songs that are being put out there today are nothing more than occultic mantras and chants that are meant to be these cute little ditties and people repeat them over and over again not even realizing what they're saying. And then the average kid today in a church, he knows more about summoning demons in Minecraft than he does about the Bible. And these kids are sitting in front of TVs all day literally baptizing their mind in occultism, baptizing their mind in blood and violence and all the works of the flesh and witchcraft and I mean there's not a there's not a video game out there that doesn't have some degree of witchcraft in it today and all of these kids are just living in this world of entertainment and then we as as Christian workers try to take them away from like 10 hours a day of nothing but occultism and Satanism and demon fighting and all of these new games that are coming out we take them away from like 10 hours a day of that and then set them in front of a, a preacher for a 40-minute message once every blue moon on a Saturday and call it a youth activity and then we wonder why these kids didn't turn out for God. All the black magic, all the mantras, all the summoning, all of the occultism and their minds have been so marinated in this stuff and so just baptized over and over and over again and we wonder why churches are not getting the job done. Not only that, these streaming services today that are coming out with this nasty stuff that's being played and is promoted as being art and artistic today, these people, they're going straight to hell when they die. God has a millstone. I'm telling you, that is sick, sadistic stuff that's going on and is being marketed under the guise of entertainment. And one thing's for certain, a child who is offended by entertainment will probably never develop a Bible reading habit. They'll probably never develop a meaningful prayer life. And they probably will not be a faithful church member because they've been offended by the entertainment industry. If we continue as the people of God to put our heads in the sand and act like it's not happening, we're being very foolish and we're jeopardizing the very children that we love and cherish. And it gives a laundry list of the, of the goods of this city. In Revelation chapter 18, verse 12, the Bible says, The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all... Uh, thine in wood and all the manner of vessels of ivory and manner of vessels most precious wood and of brass and of iron and marble, cinnamon over odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots. And notice this, and slaves and the souls of men. There are only three institutions in the world that God himself has ordained. The first one is in Genesis chapter 3. God ordained the home, Adam and Eve, man and wife, coming together as one flesh and having children. That's the home and that's how God has ordained it. The next thing he ordained was human government and the nations. In Genesis chapter 9, he told Noah, he said, give the death penalty to anybody who kills another person, which is a form of punishing evildoers. And that really is the role of government. And then also you see there how they were divided in nations in chapter number 10 of the book of Genesis. And also at the Tower of Babel, which Nimrod tried to build, you see that there is a division of the languages and God disperses the people across the world. That is the formation of human government. And then in Matthew chapter 16, you see the ordination and the beginning of the New Testament church, which God has ordained. Now, here's the thing. All three of these entities are created by God and have a role to play in society. 
But what happens when these entities decide to forsake the role that God has given them to fulfill in a society? What happens then? The New Testament clearly outlines the role of government in Romans chapter 13, verses 3 and 4. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. And so the biblical role of government is to punish, punish evil. But the problem is what happens when government redefines what evil is and flips the script and says what is good is evil and what is evil is now good. What you have at that point is a government that is punishing good. So when a government cannot define evil and good by the same standard that God does, then it starts to attack good and reward evil. You're causing a disturbance. No, I appreciate it. You are not welcome. Okay. What is your name? Michael. Michael what? Michael. I don't Michael, have to give you my yeah, surname. You do. No. Because I'm going to give you a dispersal notice to leave the area. I'm not going to leave okay? the area, sir. If you fail to do so, you will be arrested. Okay. okay. I'll be arrested. I am preaching. You are preaching. I'm going to require you to go away. You can never. Okay, then I will arrest you for a breach of peace. Plain and simple. What? Breach of peace. This is what you're doing at the moment. You're causing problems, you're disturbing people's days, and you're breaching their peace starts to encompass these two entities, the home and the church. It starts to try to control them and try to fulfill the roles that God has ordained the home and the church to fulfill. Usually there's a separation there, but when this government refuses to define evil and good the way that God defines it, then these walls start to break down and eventually the state becomes so powerful and it cannot define evil and good by God's standard of evil and good. Well, a massive Ten Commandments monument that has been outside a Pennsylvania public school for 60 years is now being removed. And the reason, one complaint from an atheist mother who filed a federal lawsuit. Tonight, Oklahoma's Attorney General is challenging a state Supreme Court decision there that's declared a monument of the Ten Commandments is a religious symbol and must be removed from the grounds of the state capitol. And so it starts to usurp these two entities and starts to fulfill the roles that God has ordained the home and the church to do. China is officially an atheist state with freedom of religion guaranteed in the constitution. State sanctioned churches do exist, but the power and glory belongs to the party. It keeps tight control. Worshippers are registered, CCTV cameras fitted, and the Bible is even being retranslated by the government to ensure what they call correct understanding. This Beijing church was also shut down in another raid last year after its leaders refused to install CCTV cameras. And in March this year, another famous church with a congregation a thousand people strong was banned. Afterwards, they pledged to hold a prayer meeting in a public square in Beijing. We also went. But the square was simply shut down by authorities. The few brave enough to come here were quietly escorted away. Throughout world history, there have been a multitude of different types of government systems. There's been the monarchy, there's been the democracy, the republic. One of them that stands out as exceptionally evil 
is the communist type of government. Communism was basically created by a man named Karl Marx. Now Karl Marx was a young man that was very troubled at a very young age. His father actually wrote him a letter saying that I, I fear for you son because I think you are demon possessed. His own father said that about him. Uh, he was so radical that Germany basically kicked him out of the country and he went to London and while he was there he penned a world famous document called the Communist Manifesto. He basically said that the uh, the poor people of the world were oppressed by the rich people and he called them the proletariat and the bourgeoisie and he said that this uh, the poor people the proletariat have been oppressed for so long that they don't even know that they're oppressed and so we must awaken them to their oppression and help them realize that they don't have to be oppressed anymore and that we could usher in this society where there is no haves and have nots there is no rich and poor there is no classes and everybody can be equal and this by bringing in this type of government there'll be a more meaningful life you can live there'll be more purpose behind what you do and it really he said we're going to usher in this political utopia and given communism's track record throughout history nothing could be farther from the truth and so karl marx with the help of a man named frederick engels pins this communist manifesto and there's several things that, that are talked about in there, but one of the things that it speaks of that are the big obstacles to implement communism into the country is two things. The nuclear family, the husband, the wife, and the children. That's got to be done away with. And then number two, Christianity, churches, has to be done away with completely because communism does not require churches anymore because now we have the state. Now, Frederick Engels actually created a section of the Communist Manifesto called the Principles of Communism. And basically, there was a series of questions that were asked on, you know, what's communism going to do this? How do, we, how do we deal with this, this, this? And two of the questions that were there was, what is the effect that communism is going to have on the home? And Mr. Engels said this, we have to awaken women to the fact that they don't need their husbands anymore. They don't need to depend on a man. And we need to awaken the children that they don't need their parents, that the state can actually take care of you. So we have to eliminate the female's dependence on a man and the children's dependence on the parents. And modern feminism has done that to women where they say, you know, we can do anything a man can do. And that's that's an expression of that, that modern expression of a communistic mindset. But also that the kids can be raised by the state. Another question that was asked in that document was, what is the effect that communism is going to have on existing churches in a nation? And this is basically the quote that it says. He says, but communism is a stage of historical development which makes all existing religions superfluous and brings about their disappearance. And so basically what he's saying is that when we implement communism into a nation that the church won't really be needed anymore because the state can do all the things that quote unquote God used to do in these people's lives. And Karl Marx went so far even to say that religion is the opium of the masses, meaning that you, you smoke opiate and then you just kind of have relaxed and you don't really care. And, and he's saying that Religion is the thing that keeps you from being awakened to your own oppression. It keeps you in a state of control. It keeps you in a state of lethargy. And it keeps you from rising up and taking over a society. To get communism into a country, initially, you have to do something called consciousness raising on a group of people. Now, that is a term straight out of the occult. And it's not surprising because Karl Marx was just completely demon-possessed. If you study his life, the man had such spiritual issues. I, I'm convinced he was dabbling into things that are unspeakable and horrible. And basically, in order to get people to go into communism, you have to do exactly what Satan did did to Eve in the Garden of Eden, you have to promise him that there's a hidden knowledge that you can have. God has oppressed you, and you, you could be on even ground with God. You could be your own God, knowing good and evil. And he tried to awaken her to her oppression. And that awakening that Eve had, where she took that forbidden fruit, is the exact same process that communism is implemented into a nation. You're oppressed and we're gonna wake you up to it. Take this, communism. All right, I'm here today with Brother Alex Simmons. Postmodernism, the key phrase or key word would be fragmentation. So uh, critical race theory would be 
what we see with social constructions. Everybody's familiar with that term now. You know, the social construction of gender, the social construction of of race, the social construction of sexuality. Basically, a postmodernist will teach a child, a room full of children, that there is no such thing as boys and girls. That's a social construct. You basically can be anything that you want. Yes. And that is completely opposite of the Bible. The Bible says that God created Adam and Eve, man and woman created he them. And so it seems like to me that postmodernism is on a on a basically a philosophical subtle level a way to just completely deconstruct the framework that God has created the universe by and basically warp these children. Yeah, the, the, again, when I say fragmentation, that's basically the deconstruction, like you said, of social categories. But since they believe that if something can be socially constructed, then you can deconstruct it and reconstruct it. And that's what we see in society right now is the attempt to reconstruct race, gender, sexuality, and history. And, and what is their goal? I mean, recon, you're, okay, you want to tear down basic Western structures, which, you know, the Western, you can say what you want to, the Western world has its flaws, but a lot of the Western ideals that we have are Bible-based and Christian-based, but they want to tear all that down and build it into what? What is their goal? Well, basically a, a giant socialist or even communist utopia. I mean, the, if you look back at the Fabian socialists, they, they were around the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century, uh, Dewey, you know, the Dewey Decimal System, he was a big one. Uh, George Bernard Shaw was another. And there, if you look up the image that they have, it's a, it's like a, a stained glass mural of someone, they have the world on a fire that they're smacking with hammers because their goal was to deconstruct and reconstruct society as they see fit. Yeah, aren't the Fabian socialists the ones that had the their logo for a while was a wolf in sheep's clothing? Yes. Wow, it's almost like the Lord warned us about these people. So let's say you're a communist and you wanna make this guy a communist too. So what do you have to do? Well, first of all, you have to set up a two-party paradigm where the communist over here and the capitalist over there. And in the mind of this person, you have to make them think that there's only two choices. And in Soviet Russia, this is how everything was framed to people. You have the bourgeoisie and the proletariats. And the bourgeoisie were the rich people of those day. And over here, the proletariats were the poor people that were oppressed. Now here's another way that they frame it even today. They say there's a battle between the rich and the poor. And even now, they like to call them this the one percenters. They say there's also the haves and the have-nots. You have the oppressors and the oppressed. You have the greedy and the needy. So to make this individual a communist, I have to make him think that everybody who's a capitalist is bad and everybody who's a communist is good. Now in today's context, another word that they're using is this one the privileged versus the non-privileged. And of course, it is always speaking about the white privilege. So in order to take this individual away from these evil capitalists into communism, you have to go through a two-step process. The first thing you have to do is, is raise their consciousness. Help them to see their oppression because they really don't see it. They have no idea that they're oppressed. Now this involves two things. You have to help them. You have to help them see the sins of other people. And then you have to see how other people's sins have hurt your life and have affected your life irreversibly. The next step you have to take them to, to bring them into communism is, is political activism. You have to organize them after you've gotten them upset. You have to point them in a direction so that they can accomplish something. And this often manifests itself as into social justice, whether it be racial or whether it be environmental. Anything of the sort is a manifestation of people whose consciousness has been raised and they've been organized in some political structure and this is their goal, social justice. We're going to try to fix the problems that these evil people over here have done and have created. 
And what dictates right and wrong to these people? What is the standard of faith and practice? Well, it's this. Modern science. And if you can raise their consciousness, get them into some sort of political activist, organizational structure, then you can create a communist utopia and everybody can have their fair share and be saved from these evil, greedy, bad, privileged oppressors over here. But I want you to know that communism is not fighting capitalism. All of this here is a total lie. Communism is not at war with capitalism. Communism is at war with Christianity. All of these words that are used, the bourgeoisie, the rich, the one percenters, the haves, the oppressors, the greedy, the bad, the white privilege, all of these are lies meant to make you think that everything on this side is some political boogeyman when the truth is this is designed to offend children and offend people away from Jesus Christ. These individuals here think that they're getting away from these bad people and they think they're getting away from capitalism but the truth is this system here on this side is not pulling you away from capitalism, it's pulling you away from Jesus Christ. None of this is political at all. This is all a masterfully crafted spiritual deception designed to send you to hell. Is there any coincidence that the political activism of today are things like Black Lives Matter and that these people are practicing Western African witchcraft and they are enchanting people into this trying to push them into what they call a fair and just society which is the language of communists. It is not political at all. All of this is designed to take this person over here thinking he's taking him into communism when the truth is all he's doing is take him away from Jesus Christ. I want you to know that everything that Satan is doing in the world is complete and total opposite of what God is doing in the world. Let me explain to you what I mean. What is the very first step in Christianity? What is that first step? Well, it's pretty simple. You have to be born again. You have to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. You have to be made a new creature in Christ. And in order to do that, the process is total opposite of the consciousness raising that the political left does. The opposite has to happen. Not, on, not you have to see the sins of the other people, but you have to... You have to see your own sin. You have to see that you are a sinner before God and that you are guilty. And not only that, you have to do the total opposite of this. You have to see... You have to see how your sin has hurt Jesus Christ and how He went to the cross of Calvary for your sin and for mine and how that when He was there on the cross, He was not some political activist. He was paying a sin debt. He was paying your sin debt. And that's what you have to understand. You have to see all that if you're going to be born again. And then the next structure after that, the next event after that, is to get involved in a local church. That's the job of a Christian. That is the next progression in the Christian life is to get involved in a local New Testament church where not social justice is preached, but the gospel is preached and people are drawn to Jesus Christ by the preaching of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the job of the local church to evangelize the masses and not to try to usher in some utopia through social justice. It's the total opposite. It's that we, are, we know the world is, is just dying and it's just a matter of time. The world is sinking like the Titanic and the gospel is getting people onto the life raft so that they can escape the sure impending doom 
upon this world. And by the way, the local church's standard of rules and faith and practice is not modern science. It's, it's the Word of God, the Bible. That is how God operates. But if you notice, this is total opposite. The entire communist system is designed to draw you away from Christianity, making you think that you're getting away from those evil, corrupt, greedy capitalists. And that's not true at all. That entire paradigm of all these one percenters and these evil, privileged people over here, that is a lie. That is not what is on the other side of that fence. Jesus Christ is on the opposite side of that fence. And I want to tell you right now, if you come on this side, you can come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And guys, here's the thing. There's another step on the outside of this equation. Is that if you come to Christ at the end of this road, there's heaven for you. But if you go this way at the end of this road, there's a place called hell. And if you reject Jesus Christ and get into all this stuff over here, you're going to hell when you die. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. You must trust Christ. There is no way, there is no way to be on this side and be in accordance with this Bible and with Jesus Christ. There is no way. Choose what side you are on. And by the way, this born again experience, the devil has a born again experience too. It's called raising your consciousness. But when you finally awaken to how oppressed you are and how evil everybody else in the world is and how much their sin has hurt you and you realize you are oppressed, you are going the wrong way. Children and the young people of today are being drawn away from Christ literally. To go this way, you must, you must offend these people. This is the plan. None of this is political. None of this. It's all about the gospel. And the devil is trying to send people to hell by making them think they're oppressed by some system. And in this process of fighting this battle, you will lose your own soul. Now, I grew up in Metro Atlanta, and I was in public school my entire life. And I got saved when I was 18 years old, started reading the Bible, studying the Bible. And it was after I got into the Word of God and started developing a biblical worldview, I realized how much of an anti-God secular philosophy I had been taught my whole life. I didn't realize that till after I got saved. And the thing is, is that in the secular public schools of today, you're not allowed to teach religion. And so the Bible's been kicked out and prayer's been kicked out, all in the name of inclusivity. An elementary school in Bartlett, Tennessee has been forced to shut down a popular Bible club after receiving complaints from an anti-religion group saying it was unconstitutional because the club was led by school district employees and was therefore, quote, really just religious instruction by public school officials. The club has been disbanded. And so when you're dealing with essential questions of life, where do we come from? Where are we going? What happens? How do we get here? If God's not a part of that equation, then you have to develop a secular humanist mindset. And the religion of secular humanism is the religion of public schools. If the universe doesn't care about us, and if we're an accident in a remote corner of the universe, in some sense it makes us more precious. The meaning in our lives is, is provided by us. We provide our own meaning. And we are here by, by accidents of evolution and, and the formation of planets, and we should enjoy our brief moment in the sun. We should make the most of our brief moment in the sun because this is all we have. And even if we're so rare that we're the only life forms in the universe, which I doubt, that makes us in some sense, while we're more insignificant, we're more special. We are endowed with a consciousness that can ask questions about the beginning of the universe and learn about the universe on its largest scales and experience everything that it means to be human, music, art, literature, and science. So for me, it should be spiritually uplifting that we're not uh, 
created with a purpose by someone who 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 takes care of us like a like a mannequin or or, or uh, with, uh, with strings determining everything. We determine our future. When you teach a child that they are a monkey-like primate creature that has evolved from a lower form of a primate creature. When you teach them that, there are behavioral consequences to that. And so basically, kindergarten through high school, these kids are given a worldview and indoctrinated into a belief system where God's not any part of the equation. When I was six years old, I didn't even know what that was. All I knew was right. Nintendo video games, but they're forcing <laughs> this upon these children. Is it because they want to try to get them early and try to just warp their mind with this what what's their deal yeah this is it's classic indoctrination uh, what, what you see i mean my my experience in college there were very 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 few christian conservative types and most of the time they're not interested in going into the teaching profession whether at the uh the college level all the way down to kindergarten so they just continually pump out people who are left-leaning and they've been pumped marxist marxist ideology throughout their entire time in college much if not all of modern education is built on the theories of a man named charles darwin now, Charles Darwin, most people don't realize it, was raised in a Christian home and actually went to seminary at some point in his life. And there was a time as a young man, he went on a trip to go observe wildlife. And while he was on that trip, he said that he saw the cruelty of the slavery business. And so in his writings, he came to the conclusion that because life is so cruel and life is so hard, that there is no way a benevolent, loving God could be behind this creation. And so that soured him on the idea of a creator God. And I wonder in this period of his life, what would have happened if Mr. Darwin had gotten the gospel and learned about the true love of Jesus Christ, how that Christ uh, commended his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What would have been different in Mr. Darwin's life? Well. I don't know, only God knows that. But what is for certain is that this man had been offended as a young man, drawn away from God, and he is now the poster child of the biological system, the secular humanist mindset that is now drawing millions, if not billions, of children away from God as well. And not only that, even after his lifetime, there was a generation that came up behind him that got a hold of his theories and used them to do unspeakable things to other human beings. This man's beliefs and teachings are dangerous because it takes God out of the equation and shows you a universe where there is no loving God. Now, anybody who takes the time to study early American history cannot deny the strong influence of Bible-believing Christianity upon the formation of this nation. And the early Puritans got together and decided we need to educate our children. And the only reason they wanted to educate kids was so that they could read the Bible. Now, you have to understand, these people had fled from the Pope in Catholicism in Europe and so much persecution going on there. And they wanted their children to be able to know the Word of God for themselves so that they were not dependent upon some tyrannical ecclesiastical structure like popery. And so the very first book that was used as a textbook in the United States of America was something called the New England Primer. 
And it says here on page three and four of the New England Primer, it says the very purpose for which it was created. It says, and this was the function of the New England Primer. Uh, with it, millions were taught to read. Notice this, that they might read the Bible. And with these millions were catechized un unceasingly that they might find in the Bible only what one of many priesthoods has decided that book contained. The purpose of early American education was to teach you to read so that you could read the Bible. And it is such a tragedy that modern education now is being used to destroy your faith in the Bible, to push you away from the Bible. It's like the whole thing has been spun on its head. You are not being taught to read so that you can read the Bible. You're being taught to read so that you could be indoctrinated into a secular humanist society and belief system. In short, the very purpose of early American education was so that you could read so that you could draw close to God. And modern education is teaching you how to read so that you can be drawn away from God. One of the primary tools that Satan is using to subvert and to offend children away from God is modern education. By teaching them that they are not a created being, created by a creator, but they are a product of an evolutionary process that has no real answer where it came from and where it's going. Now, in the world of education, it's being used in multiple different facets to draw people away from the Lord. And in our chart here, we have on this side a biblical worldview, and on this side we have an atheist, secular Marxist worldview. Now, these two worldviews are completely incompatible. There's no way you can reconcile the two. And so the way for a young person here to develop a biblical worldview is through Christian school education, Bible education, Sunday school. There's a number of different things I could put there to show you, you know, how to develop a biblical worldview and learn the Bible. I believe the local church and the Christian home is responsible for this happening in a child's life. Uh, but over here we have the, uh, the, the game plan, the layout. How is a child drawn away from a biblical worldview? Well, the answer is pretty simple. It's through public education, secular education. Uh, they're taught a secular evolutionary worldview. The thing is, is that the, the government system has public schools as being free, but there is a green wall there between public school and secular college. And I put that there on purpose because there's a big barrier that prevents a lot of people from going from high school to these major colleges. And what is that barrier? Well, it, it's pretty simple. Um, that barrier is financial. So how do you get a kid who grows up in a poor home and he wants to go to secular college, he doesn't really have any athletic skills or something like that, how can he afford to do this? So the government comes up with a program called the Student Loan Program. What this did was it just basically told him, come to the office, we'll sign you up, and we'll give you all the money that you want to go to secular college so that you can learn and be indoctrinated in this. And basically this created something that we now call in America the student loan, student loan crisis. Then we can talk about what to do with the people that are in a mess. But you can't keep putting people in a mess and try to fix the mess. The first step is to stop putting people into the mess. It's not working. It's an abject, epic failure. It's destroyed people's lives. It's had an effect on the spiritual economy of this nation. We the people need to quit letting Congress, in our name, using our signature, insure loans that put young people deeply into debt so they can't breathe. We need to stop it. And we have now reached the threshold of over a trillion dollars in debt owed by people in secular colleges. And they're starting their life and they are completely indoctrinated into these atheistic secular Marxist worldview. And not only that, they're going into jobs that don't pay well and they have basically made themselves complete slaves 
debt slaves to the federal government. And these loans that people take from the government are not forgivable, they're not bankruptable, and the only way you can get out of this loan is if you die. And so, out of the political sector of people that have this worldview, there has risen another group like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and so many others that are now implementing something called student loan forgiveness. Just, we're going to wipe away the debt, and all of you folks who worked hard and paid your bills and paid your debt off, doesn't matter. Everybody who's swimming in debt, we're just going to wipe the whole thing off and get rid of it. Which the truth is, the program should have never started to begin with. It should have never happened. It really was not a good idea. But it was done by design to make you a slave to the secular government and enable you, enable you to cross this green barrier from public school and secular college. It enabled you to do that so that you could be pushed deeper into this atheist, secular, Marxist worldview so that you could be drawn away and pulled away from Jesus Christ. And so with the political landscape of America today, what's going to happen is now this forgiveness program is going to come in and that whole barrier is going to be wiped away. And now, just like any other European secular nation, Second college is going to be free. And so what you're going to have is you're going to have basically a stampede and the floodgates are going to open with young people heading this way, thinking they're going to get a secular college education and all they're going to do is be indoctrinated even deeper into an atheistic, secular, Marxist worldview that is as anti-God, anti-Christ as it possibly can be. In the Garden of Eden, the fruit that Satan held up to Eve was of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the fruit that Satan is holding up now to young people is a free education. Take this and your eyes will be opened and you should be as gods knowing good and evil. And it's the same trap. That's the bait. And it's pulling you away from God into this worldview system right there. And that is how Satan is using education to draw people away from Christ and offend them away from the gospel. And ladies and gentlemen, don't be fooled. I'm for education. I don't think there's any glory in being ignorant. But modern education is nothing more than a satanic system of indoctrination putting up a facade of higher education. This is nothing more than a satanic trap designed to destroy your faith in the Word of God remove any biblical worldview from your mind and indoctrinate you into the Marxist secular world system. This is a dangerous trap and there's coming a day very soon where it will be free and there will be grave spiritual consequences for those who take the fruit. This mystery Babylon, this city, this entity, whatever you want to define it as, will fulfill every luxury that you could ever want and it can fulfill every lust that any fallen depraved man could ever want. Why would it throw that in there at the end? Slaves and the souls of men. I believe that Satan has many tools that he uses to offend young people away from Christ but I believe his most effective tool is religion. There are basically three ways in which Satan offends young people away from God. He does it spiritually with bad doctrine. He does it physically in the world of religion through defilement and abuse of that nature. And also he does it emotionally through disposition. And so let's examine spiritually how people are offended away from Christ. If you're Satan and you look here at this person and he's being uh, suffered towards Christ with a true gospel preached by a true preacher in a true church and you see people come into Christ through these avenues here, what is your approach? Do you attack this and you try to destroy this? I, I don't think that's what Satan has done at all. What you do is you imitate this. And so what you do is you actually create a false gospel with false preachers and create a false church. and. We know that that's sin, but you give it a makeover, make it look like something different. And instead of preaching the true Christ, 
you have these people preaching a false Christ. And so one of the most effective ways to offend people away from Jesus Christ is to make them think that they are actually coming to Christ. But it's not a Christ that is described in the Bible. It's a false Christ by a false gospel, false preachers, and given by a false church. You see, I think we underestimate Satan. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he's been doing it a very long time, and he's very good at it. Now, everything that is not a part of Bible doctrine is a part of a system that we'll call Mystery Babylon, which is a system that is based upon good works, global unity, and a false worship. Satan can imitate a religious euphoria, and he, he can do that very effectively. And he uses modern worship in churches to do that, to pull you into a false system with, with a false gospel, false preachers, a false church, a way into a false Christ. He can do that very effectively. And see, it's through the act of imitation that children, young people, are swept away into a false religious system and offended away from Jesus Christ spiritually. The way that Satan offends them spiritually is by bad doctrine. Now, this is the part of the documentary that I really wish I did not have to make. I wish there was some way around this. I wish there was some way I could do this whole documentary and not talk about this one subject. But we have to say it. Not only are children offended away from Christ spiritually by bad doctrine, but there are children that are offended away from Christ physically by defilement. There are people in this world that are so sick that they will infiltrate churches and they will physically abuse children. They will use their position of authority to gain someone's trust and then they will do terrible things to that child and leave them broken and undone and move on. And many people when they go to church they let their guard down and think, you know, this is this doesn't happen here. This happens out there in the world, but the truth is, we have to be ever vigilant in this dark day. And this is the point where I could easily point out the things that had happened in Hillsong with Brian Houston's father years ago, and I could point out the things that have happened in Roman Catholicism throughout the years, and all of those are legitimate. Those things are very serious. But even in the world of orthodoxy, even in so-called independent Baptist churches, there are men who have crept in through the years and have done terrible things to young women especially. And I want to say there is no excuse for any of that ever. There is no angle that can justify that. You deserve everything that is coming your way. And I even want to say that those who cover for those and make light for those and excuse those who have done terrible things to children, then you're no better. You're just as guilty. You're sick, and there is no excuse for you. So biblically, what do you say to religious leaders and those who have been involved in situations like this? What do you say? Well, the only thing I can really say is what Jesus has already said. Jesus said, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. God says there's something coming your way and you would have been better off having died than to have lived and done that and faced God with that. To me, that is a horrifying verse. And that's not applying to any specific one person. That's for everybody, including religious leaders, including those who claim to be orthodox and those who believe the Bible. It is so important that churches don't let their guard down on this stuff. We have to protect children. We have to protect our young people from those who would offend them physically in our churches. I wish this stuff never happened. I wish it didn't, but it does. And to act like it doesn't happen would make us complicit in the crimes that have been committed. God has a millstone. And God is not playing games. And I think it's time that we wake up and recognize that there are those in the world of religion 
that are offending children physically and drawing them away from Jesus Christ. There are many people out there that they will never, ever, ever listen to any preacher or any Bible sermon or anything because of something that happened to them as a child. They've been offended. They've been drawn away. And Jesus says, you'd have been better off dying than to have ever done that to somebody. God has a millstone and that should terrify some people. There are many things in the world that Satan uses to offend children away from Christ. And there's many things in the world of false religion that Satan uses to pull children away from Christ. And we talked about how they're spiritually being offended and how that they are physically being offended. But there's another way that they're being offended and drawn away from Christ. And I would say that's emotionally you know, the spiritual aspect has to do with doctrine and the bad doctrines they're being taught, but also the physical aspect is defilement, how they've been abused physically at a church. But I would say that emotionally, it's about disposition in a church. It's not bad churches that are doing that, it's good churches that are doing that. We can talk about all the horrible, way out there things that are out there. Children that are being raised in a church that is dead and going through the motions of religion just out of sheer habit, you are offending people away from Jesus Christ as well. I mean, you think about it. This kid is raised in a supposed Christian home and goes to church every week, and the Sunday school teacher is not prepared for the Sunday school class, not been praying, not been walking with God. They just go in there and just exercise some religious motion, read something out of a handbook somewhere, and bore the kids to death for 45 minutes. And then they got to go into a church service where the pastor gets up there and he just, he just talks about current events and rambles about nothing. He has a Bible in his hand, but he's not preaching that Bible in his hand. And then they have to sit through a song service where the saints of God have been just so consumed with the world and they have no joy in their heart. And uh, they're, just, they're just going through the motions because they, that's just what we do. We just, we, just, we just go to church and that's it. And I'm telling you, it's a game. It's a religious game. And most children, especially most teenagers, are sitting there week in and week out, not there by choice. They're there because they have to be there. And they're just biding their time. They're waiting for the day that they can go off on their own and be set free from the shackles of this dreadful, boring, dead religion that their parents have placed them in. The church that is going through the motions, making Jesus Christ boring, making salvation boring, making the Bible boring, are offending kids away from Christ. You think about it with me for a moment. Why are these kids so lured away by sports? Well, it's because people are attracted to passion and at least they can find somebody who, who is passionate about this, this whatever it is, this sports team or, or this concept, whatever it is, they're drawn to that. But I want to tell you that a dead church going through the dead motions is just as much an offense to young people as a wild, crazy, heretical church. And I think it's time that God's people awaken to righteousness because there's children out there who are dying and going to hell. There are people who need the gospel, especially your own children need the gospel. I want to talk to the daddies who are watching this video, you men that are raising your families. You need to wake up and realize that there is a war for the affection of your children, for the attention of your children. And if you don't get your family into a good, solid church, you're going to lose your own kids to the world. I believe it's time that God's people stop playing games. I believe it's time that God's people stop going through the motions. I think it's time that we adorn the doctrine of Jesus Christ. You know, we talk about a fin being drawn away into the world and being drawn away from Christ. But you know, Jesus said, if I, I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And I want Jesus Christ to be lifted up in my preaching. I want Jesus Christ to be lifted up in my living. And I want, I want more than anything, I want the world and my own family and the children of this world to know that Jesus means everything to me. That's what I want. And if I'm not doing that, if I'm not lifting up Christ in my life so that they can be drawn to Jesus, then just by simple omission, 
I'm offending them away from the Lord. You know, there was a carnal church in the New Testament. It was the church at Corinth. I mean, they were extremely carnal. And even Paul told them, he said, you're carnal. But towards the very end of 1 Corinthians, he says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And I think it's time God's people wake up and realize the responsibility we have to live the Christian life the way that God designed for it to be lived and to lift up Jesus Christ before the world, before our own children, and to reach children with the gospel. The truth is you can be orthodox, you can be a staunch fundamentalist and be doctrinally straight, but when they look at your life, they don't see Jesus. And I want to be a joyful Christian. I want to be one that when they see me, they see the beauty of the Christian life. I want to adorn the doctrine of God with, with my life. I want people to know that it's wonderful to know Jesus. It's wonderful to go to church. It's wonderful to read the Bible. It's, it's exciting to know Christ. I want my life to say that. And truth be told, we can talk about all the ones who do horrible things. But unless we are lifting up Jesus in our lives, then we're just part of the problem ourselves. Dead Orthodox churches are just as much a part of the problem as exciting, lively, heretical churches. Neither one of those groups is lifting up Jesus Christ and glorifying Him to the world. Hello friend, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. We had many friends that helped us with compiling all the information and all the uh, editing and everything that went into it and we are thankful that God has allowed us to do this video. Through circumstances in recent history and observing certain things going on in the world, God has stirred up my heart for young people and given me a burden for reaching young people with the gospel. And I know that so many people throughout history that we see, there were this, these monsters of history. You know, there was a time where they were children and they could have been reached with the gospel. And I think of many of these great political leaders, these, the tyrants of history, and I think, you know, there was a window where they could have been reached and something happened. I don't know what it was, but something drew them away. Something offended them. And Jesus' warning about the millstone, offending little ones, I take that very seriously, and I think you should as well. And there's many ways I think we can do that, uh, more than one way, but I think it's time that we step back and we think, are we really reaching children with the gospel? Now, we dealt with Mr. Babylon, and we dealt with this system in many of our previous videos that we have made on our channel. And I believe that Mr. Babylon is the world system as a whole. But I see here in Revelation 17 that there's this, this whore. Upon her head is the names of blasphemy. Verse 13 of chapter 18 of the book of Revelation gives all the things that it deals with. And one of the things at the very end is the slaves and the souls of men. And I want to tell you today, there is a war going on right now for the souls of children. And Mr. Babylon is working overtime to try to pull these children away from Christ using religion, entertainment, education, and politics to accomplish that goal. And Jesus is coming again. And there's no doubt in my mind we are in the end days. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 18, verse 20, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And I find it interesting how that God threw down Mystery Babylon as a great millstone. I think that there is going to be an end times war on children. And I want to say to you that if you're not in Christ, then you're a part of this world system. You're a part of the Mystery Babylon system. When the Lord judges that system, you're going to be on the wrong side of that. And you need to come to Jesus Christ. 
I don't care if you're a movie star or you're a news anchor or you're a high-ranking politician or even a, somebody just working a regular job somewhere. If you're not in Christ, you're going to be in that system. And when God casts the millstone into the sea, which is His picture of judgment, you're going to be a part of that. And you'll die and go to hell without Jesus Christ. There is a king that is coming and his name is Jesus. And he has offered terms of peace already. But there's going to come a day where he will invade this world. And he will take it. And he will rule and reign. And those who have made peace with this coming king by receiving his son Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will be spared from the wrath to come. But those who reject Christ, then you're in this Mystery Babylon system and you're part of the judgment that is coming. You will experience that. Now guys, I want to say several things to you. And first of all, if you're a Christian parent, you need to get your children into a local church that preaches and teaches the Bible. We have a website set up called independentbaptist.church where uh, you can use that as a directory to find a church in your area. And we hope that you would take advantage of that. And also, if you're not saved, I want to encourage you to get saved. Come to Christ today and receive Him as your Savior. The Bible says, John 1, 12, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Come to Christ today. And if you are already saved and you're in a good church, I want to encourage you. We have got to do everything we can to reach young people with the gospel. And we need to stand against things and even people who would offend young people away from Christ. You know, I believe that the Lord, when He told us in 1 John chapter 2, Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. For any man to love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I think when He said that, He wasn't trying to make us pharisaical, better than you, holier than thou type people. He was trying to tell us that don't get too close with this Mr. Babylon world system because you start to love it, then it'll start to steal your heart away from God. And I think that's what happens with a lot of young people today. They just get too enamored with the world system. They get deceived and, and it robs them. It literally robs them of their love for Christ and they get offended away. And all the blessings that God had for them are now spoiled and forfeited. You know, there was a man named D.L. Moody who got saved. And he started a Sunday school in the city of Chicago. Started bringing young people in. <laughs> and uh, the Sunday school movement was started uh, out, of that, uh, out of that group of people. And there was a story where one of these young boys who was sleeping on the streets got up one Sunday and went down to the Sunday school there that Mr. Moody ran. And one of his buddies said, you know, why? Why are you going down there? Why are you going to that Sunday school? And he said this, he said, there's not many places in the world where people love me, but they love me over there. <laughs> and I thank God for that. And I want to tell you again, I think it's time that God's people, we step back, reevaluate, and say, you know what? I want to do everything I can to suffer little children to come to Christ. Suffer them and forbid them not. You know, I was doing the study on the word offend and looking at that and I asked God, you know, what is, the, what is the opposite of that word? And I think the answer is a few chapters later where Jesus said, suffer the little ones to come unto me. And friend, we need to be suffering children to come to Christ, pushing them to Christ, encouraging them to come to Christ, giving them every opportunity to hear the word of God preached and and I want my kids to be involved in church and youth camp, mission trips, everything. I want my kids to be suffered towards the Lord. I want to encourage them to come to Christ and to know Christ. I want that. I want to be that kind of daddy. I want to be that kind of Christian worker. I want to be that kind of preacher. And I hope that you do as well. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please use our website, independentbaptist.church. And if there's ever anything we can do for you guys, please let us know. We love you. We're praying for you. And we look forward to many more good videos like this in the very near future. God bless you.
I think I understand why when John saw it. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. How much do you think is fake that you see in space? Man, um... You see four, but there's really five. Five signs and wonders. You see four, but there's really five. It blew his mind.